topic that we began to touch on yesterday, I think, but it's obviously very important this whole thing, and that's, that's the question of, of ethics and moral responsibilities of our colleges towards communities and economic development. And to lead that conversation, to lead it off, uh, we've asked um, Tony Alloy, uh, who uh, runs the uh, archaeology program at the uh, National Institute for Cultural Heritage and Belize, and Elizabeth Graham, uh, who's a professor here at UCL. And, uh, and a colleague of mine is in Belize to, uh, to have a conversation among, between themselves for a little bit and then have one with you. And with that, I'm going to turn it over. I think that's time is correct, right? But I'm very happy to be involved with this thing for showing up on the screen. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, good morning. And thanks for the invitation to participate. Uh, this is sort of my old stomping grounds because I did my PhD right here at UCL. Um, but anyway, I thought of uh, starting this presentation today by asking a question, and that was, uh, you know, how many of you in the audience have ever spent time uh, managing cultural resources for a state agency in a developing country? And right away it became obvious that uh, the likelihood was very slim. I know this did for a little while at least, so um, you know, it's really good that her and I have been having just this very conversation. But before we start the conversation, I thought that it was important for us to address some definitions. For instance, first of all, we're talking about archaeology. There are diverse themes in our, of archaeology. Obviously, if you're into Hollywood, it's about box office hits and success. Um, and we've all known about you know, Gibson's uh, lift of course, in Indiana Jones. Um, but what does archaeology mean to most academics? And to most academics, it's about scholarship, it's about research, and especially about tenure, whether we like it or not. And I know that because I've been there. He said, I, I sort of bridge the gap as an academic as well as being responsible for managing cultural heritage for the state. Um, for people in the developing world, archaeology has another meaning, and that is it's about national identity, it's about cultural heritage, education development, especially jobs, and also about branding, about trying to you know, make a place in the world for one's own <coughs> small country, especially in the case of Belize. And the greatest challenge for developing countries, um, as usual, is limited human financial resources. So I just wanted to touch on that part. I want to the responsibilities, because this conversation will be about responsibilities for ethical and moral. Well, to communities, what do we mean by communities? And to me, communities include three, but notice there's a lot of space so we can add to this. I just put this together this morning, by the way. Um, but one of the communities that we have ethical and moral obligations to and responsibilities are national agencies, especially in our case, the agencies, if you work outside of your own country, those national agencies that give you the privilege to work in their countries. In other words, gives you a research permit because you can't do archaeology in those countries without a permit. We also have obligations to the local communities that we work in um, and also to the scientific community of which we are a part. Now let me just look at each of them separately um, and quickly here. Um, national agencies, it's really imperative that as archaeologists, we try to understand the state institutions that we work under. We need to know their goals, their challenges. Um, we need to develop symbiotic partnerships with them that will help develop or that will help them to realize some of their goals. Um, we need to help them conserve the cultural heritage that is their primary responsibility. We also need to produce timely reports on the data that we collect and the interpretations that we make. And if you don't like the, because I, I read some of the articles and some people say, oh, you know, some state agencies are corrupt and they have these agendas. Well, to be honest with you, in small developing countries like mine, um, there's no real government agenda. The government is so busy trying to meet balance of payments, they have no time to tell us how to run the Institute of Archaeology. So, you know, a lot of times there are no national agendas that we're trying to make here. Um, but we also need, like I said, but if you don't like them, then work elsewhere. You know, because then don't 
perjuring yourself. So, very important. The second group of people that we have responsibility is to our local communities. But you need to understand the social political relations in a community. You know, Belize is very small, yet it's so ethnically diverse. We need you know, 300,000 people, and we have more than 12 ethnic groups. Then even a community that might be, you know, mono uh, ethnic, you know, where there's only one ethnic group, there are affiliations. Those affiliations are sometimes political, religious, or familial. And sometimes, you know, you say, okay, I've been working with this one, uh, this one group. Well, party changes, the, the party that's in power changes, and all of a sudden it's another group in the small village. And we're talking about villages of like 400 people sometimes, and there are all these affiliations. So you need to know some of these things. Um, we also need to educate the community about our research. I have seen many archaeologists come to Belize, they show up at my office, we discuss the, the, the project, and I give them their permits, and then they go. And they never do any presentations in the community to tell the people what they're actually doing. Uh, they work in isolation. We try to discourage that. You know, we say, come on, we have to do it, you know, better than that. But we also need to educate them about the value of conservation, because that can influence looting. Um, we need to do presentations about our work and subsequent our interpretations to produce publications, but publications that you know people who don't have the level of education that we have uh, that they can understand. Um, if I give them a copy of my you know paper in Latin American antiquity, the jargon will just you know throw them and they'll throw the paper away. So we need to do that. We also need to train and hire local people and refrain from being politically involved. I have had to go and clean up messes because people come in and they get involved politically and then they leave. It's like an absentee landlord. You know, you come in and you work at your site and then you leave. And then guess what? You know, you make promises that you didn't keep. And then the people come to my office and start to say, well, you know, we were told by the archaeologists that um, you know we would uh, have a uh, you know, education program to train two guys, but they've gone. And so you know, we need to, to make sure we don't do that. And then finally, we have responsibilities to the scientific community um, and to the people who fund our research in this case. Um, and some of these responsibilities include the timely publication of our data and our interpretations. Um, because as you all know, you know, archaeology is disruptive. And the only evidence of the materials that we have recorded are is the record that we have, so we need to publish early. And we also should lobby granting agencies to include conservation and community projects as important components of the research projects. You know, as this will tell you, that if you're in the US, the National Science Foundation does not allow you to do conservation with their money or um, other, other big agencies. They don't. You know, thankfully, some of the banking agencies, like the World Bank and IDB, etc., do allow some conservation. So again, we need to allow them as a community and say this has got to change. Otherwise, we go in. You know, you, I, I mentioned this in one of my I said in one of my questions that every time you excavate a site, um, sites, the, the, the whole site formation process is that eventually they reach an equilibrium with the environment. We go, we excavate, we change the equilibrium, and if you're in the tropics, rainfall, etc., starts degradation, rapid degradation of those sites. So it is important that we have that responsibility to help you preserve. And finally, to maintain professional conduct. You know, a lot of times there's backstabbing, or you know, we talk negatively about, about the institutions we work with or work for, uh, about colleagues. And I think that there are better ways of doing that. And you know, one of the things we try to um, encourage and release is you know, partnerships, teamwork. We can't do it alone. We have to work together. Thank you. Um, I really like to think about the time of the questions. Uh, but what, I, what I'd like to do is I'll kind of summarize what I think are the most important points that I would like to make. And then, um, in case I don't forget, I will accept the most important thing. Um, I think, first of all, I'm not, as an archaeologist, I'm not 
non public alternatives is professional. So I suppose you can say I, I represent the raw uh, archaeology speakers who feel who isn't a professional but does uh, archaeology and, and with the idea that it is important enough us uh, the, the communities and the country that we work for benefit in some way. Um, so even though I'm not a professional, that's always been in the back of my mind. Uh, before I just introduce some well, what I think important aspects of my experience, I guess to, to isolate what I think the most important things that I've learned over the last, uh, well, by January, well, it's been 40, 40 years that I've been working uh, in the lead. And um, I guess one of the first things, and I've talked to Jaime about this, that when you do uh, start to take uh, steps, let's say, to get development grants and decide what you're going to ask money for, obviously, if you're making decisions, you're an outsider, but you're making decisions that are going to affect the whole community. And I, I, I try to think about uh, the good and bad uh, components of that. And I made a decision early on that to justify that behavior, I would have to be in the lead to take the consequences of my actions. So I have never thought about doing the archaeology anywhere else but the lead. Because I have become involved in local communities, various development issues. And I feel that um, I have to be there for the rest of my life. Uh, because then I will be there to accept any of the consequences of my actions, which I think is very important. Um, part of that stems from some of my early experiences when I, as Heine said, I, I did work with the government in the years managing archaeological sites. And I have to say, I was a bit discouraged by working with various development agencies because they were there in the country for a very short time. And I can remember the first development uh, package I had to manage was a uh, re partial reconstruction of buildings at an archaeological site. And we laughed about this, but it's not funny. Uh, so you set up the schedule. Obviously, the dry season comes, that's when you do your work, right? No. <laughs> because the development schedule is set up according to temperate climate countries. So they expect you to work through the entire wet season, which is pretty much a waste of money. But it doesn't matter because you know the, the agendas of those agencies are, are temperate climate, not tropics. And that hasn't changed, right? Hasn't changed for the recent uh, grants. Even if they are for structural conservation, has to be done according to a temperate climate schedule, despite the fact that you have nine months of rain. So I became you know a little discouraged, partly by the agendas of some of those agencies, as well as the fact that the people who work for them were in the least temporarily. And, and that got me thinking about being there. If you're going to make decisions about local communities, then you better be there for the whole term and not just in and out. The other thing is time on my part. I'm, I'm not a professional, so I am going to make mistakes. But also, my primary role is research. It's teaching. And the time factor is there's just not enough time usually for me to devote to applying for various grants. And there are only two times where I've really managed to get any substantial amount of money, and most of the time they're small amounts. Although small amounts can make a big difference, hugely. Uh, but most of the time I fail. And um, and it's partly because when I was well, when I am successful, it's usually when I have more time to chase up these, these grants. And so that is that's discouraging. You know, the will is there, but I don't, don't have the time. Um, I already mentioned um, agendas. Um, and it isn't just timing. It's that in my dealing with various organizations and beliefs over the years, um, when they come in, they come in with ideas about what money is going to go for. And it doesn't matter it doesn't matter that I've been there for 35 years. It doesn't matter that we've been working with, let's say, the Village of Indian Church for 10 or 12 years, <clears throat> that we've already had funding for some of us and that, you know, I think we have some basis for asking for a few thousand dollars to help the villagers with their bank accounts. But if the, if the, if the agency says, no, nope, we're doing women's cooperatives this year. Or in another case, no, we're doing primary school education. 
and there were no opportunities for to build on what we've already, uh, let's say, accomplished in your degree. And that has been very discouraging to me. That coupled with the fact that I don't have time to write grants that say one thing and do another, I have seen some, I have seen some projects that need very little money go down the drain. Um, and then finally, I really do think we have to think of ways of very long-term planning. And I mean this, not just agencies, but us archaeologists, because one of the big problems I see in research is that we're given money to excavate and then try to get money to make those collections more accessible or conserved or uh, artifact libraries, places where local communities can have access to, to um, let's say, Copies of those artifacts, which is one of the things we've been trying for years. I mean, this is the, well, in Indian Church, there is a, a, a local crafts group which did develop as a result of some grants we got for, over the years. And um, one of the things that, that distinguishes it, or that did distinguish it, <laughs> is access to the artifacts from London I so they can copy designs that they need. But um, unless we get continued funding to facilitate that, it doesn't work. And on the research end, it is so frustrating. Uh, right now, I'm involved with uh, Canadian grants, which could possibly fill the bill. But I have to, I can't say to them, look, you funded all the archaeology. Help us make the artifacts more accessible. And there will be plenty of opportunities for Canadian graduate students. I can't. I have to phrase it in some way that. It's the research, and then somehow <coughs> decide in there that, that the artifacts have to need, well, not just better care, but greater accessibility. And that's probably one of the most frustrating things in my career. And so I think that what we have to do on the research end is get these granting organizations to think about giving money for excavation, 40 year grants, let's say. I was talking to Chris about this. Excavate for six years, and the other 36 years, <laughs> think about how you are going to make the information that you've excavated available to the community. But instead, I could, uh, I could instead apply for you know, a 20 year grant and be excavating it for the last minute. And then, you know, the material, some of my colleagues would say, oh, we take care of the material. So I'll wash, we label it, we put it in a plastic bag, we tie it with a nice label. And then it goes in a, in a nice, you know, plastic container in a bodega or in Belmont. Pond. Well, guess how long plastic containers last in the tropics? Ten years, maybe? And then they fall apart. But the archaeologists are already gone, and so they feel, yeah, it's okay. We, we, we've done what we should do. And then access to the collections is just so difficult, and the locals, what they see is researchers coming in, digging things up, and then they never rarely see what's, what's going up. So that, that is a big problem. Um, well, I think I'll stop there, because we think we should open it up to questions and answers. I want to have just a few things. I don't know about four or five pictures. Um, um, uh, in addition to working in Martin, we visit the site called Laminati, where we <coughs> this craft project evolved, and, and uh, other education projects. I'm working out on Emily's key. And this is interesting because the uh, instead of government responsibility for the site, trying local, uh, raising money locally for a uh, managing the site, and it's a struggle, but owing to some really strong local um, conservation group, heritage group, and, you know, we're getting it. And this uh, last season, my co-director of the site, Scott Simmons, University of uh, North Carolina and Hyman, right? You two got together this program where some of the Gale University students, um, Ketchy and Mopar Maya, came out with us to the key and did a whole uh, series of workshops and talks with the local primary and secondary schools, you know, as well as uh, working with the archaeology. So, so that's kind of interesting. We hope to keep that up. Um, this is Lama and I, where I have, have worked for a long time, and my husband actually worked at the site for. Uh, over 10 years. And another thing that, uh, in terms of cooperation, I doubt it's cooperating with the governments involved. Um, when Jaime and his department, Institute of Archaeology, were thinking 
Well, had applied for development grants, I would then apply for research grants so that we could work together on whatever those projects were. And that's what you're seeing here at Lam and I. Um, we did research along with um, some of the, the work that the Institute of Archaeology was doing um, at the site. And just an example of some of the cooperation issues of how we had excavated and these are some of the men. We actually put the finances together as well. We got money from National Geographic and Social Science. And we made the funding through the Australian Bank. And I didn't give American dollar in the bank. This is just an artisan center that was built as a result of some grants from the Canadians and the British High Commission uh, in Belize. Um, and uh, it, it is up and running, but since then it's been very difficult to get money to help. Um, the villagers with the, fin the financing. They, they don't really know much about management of uh, crafts or bank accounts and things like that. And that is where I've been in the last few years, not being able to get funding to help them out. Um, just some of the, the early products, which, as I say, are modeled. Some of them are modeled after um, some of the artifacts that last night. But again, it's, gonna, it's harder to access those artifacts now because we need more funding to improve storage. And um, so they only have access to a limited amount. I wasn't sure to, to, to show this shot or not. Did you see these? Uh, it, it sounds like such a, a non-important issue, but you see these blocks of galvanized zinc. Well, that is a design that's a result of maybe about 12 years of work on our part, experimenting with storage material that can actually hold up in the closets. And uh, we make trays out of the material that we use for pottery and, and starting in 1983. And they're still unrusted, even though they've been outside all that time. So what we did was start to make storage containers out of that material. I think we finally got the design down <laughs> last year. Uh, but you know, a simple thing like that, for example, it was difficult for me to get to get funding. Um, and I bought I got a little money from UCL actually to finally do the, the, the design for those containers. And I think it can revolutionize um, human storage in, in the UCL. So, uh, so uh, we'll leave you with that. Culture and tourism, in my case, 
And I just say, guess what? Our primary responsibility is to preserve the past, the Asian past for the future. And that's our agenda, preserving the past for the future. And everything we do focuses on that goal. And that doesn't change. Um, and if I leave tomorrow, that agenda won't change in the country at least. Um, I know that, again, speaking with colleagues, because I also do research, um, uh, who do research in some of the Latin American countries and say, well, you know, you submit your permit and you have to wait until you get there and you don't get a permit. Again, I know in Belize, before you come to the country, you submit your proposal and you know that you want, you know, people tell you, yes, fine, just tell me you'll get your permit. So there's no waiting period, there's no guessing game. Um, maybe it's just a difference in cultural background. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was thinking, I suppose it's not a bad idea for uh, for departments of archaeology to have longer term agendas, is that what you mean? Uh, let me give you an example, the state of Israel, the Antiquities Authority decided, okay. the state of Israel, the Antiquities Authority decided that given the, the overwhelming number of archaeological excavations taking place in the country, their national agenda is now to reduce the number of excavations to 50 every year, no more, so they can preserve the past. So they are saying, because we want to reduce it to 50 every year, we will allow only projects that have five-year funding. Unless you have five-year funding and you know that you're serious, you cannot come, because we really need to be that. Okay, in Peru, uh, where I'm also, where I'm working, I, when I, I, the issue of permit is crucial. You cannot plan, you don't go, when you're there, if you get a permit or not, you, you, you cannot plan. And that has to be with national laws about people that have to sign, they can sign only one excavation at a time. So everybody already in the last minute before they sign off to go and work with other people to get your permit. You cannot work without a, a, a local cooperator. So I know that Belize is a wonderful case study where you can really do excellent archaeology, but that's not the case in most of Latin America. As you indicated in Guatemala, you have political changes on time. And, and the reason why a lot of archaeologists are not working very well with state organs is because state organs are unreliable and it's very difficult to predict, not because they're corrupt person. I've never met a corrupt archaeologist in my life in my working life, but that's me and um, no, but they cannot <laughs> they cannot know what would come next. So their agendas are not always their cultural agenda, they're a huge political agenda, a huge turnover all the time, so they're unpredictable. And therefore you cannot develop relationship based on any kind of predictability if you want to do a 10 year project. Yeah, no, no, like I said, uh, you know, I, I know that that situation does exist in some of the countries, uh, neighboring countries. Uh, I'm just, you know, glad and uh, to some degree I feel fortunate that we don't have that situation in the least. But there, I was just thinking, let's say there, there might come a time when you want to restrict excavation. Um, usually, we would probably know about it. Thanks. Yes. Um, I'll give you an example. In, in Belize, if um, you know, if you come and say you know, in your proposal that you like this says you'll do this in advance. You propose you want to dig that pyramid, the picture that this showed a little while ago, and you said, well, your budget is uh, you know ten thousand U.S. dollars. I'm going to laugh and say, I'm going to excavate that big pyramid, and then what? You won't have money to conserve it. You know, you're going to leave it exposed. No. Find some other research. That can fit your budget, and we will give you a permit, provided you know you, you have all the other conditions. And the conditions are set up. You can go on our web page and you can get all those conditions for a permit. And like in this is case, once you get your first permit, usually if you're working at the same site, you're not going to change site. Then the next year you apply, it's we refer to it as a permit renewal. So you don't have to go through all the hoops again. So we try to make it very simple process. I just wanted to follow up on what you were saying about the, the long term nature of leading on after excavations. The, uh, some interviews I've been doing in Jordan uh, had similar situations a little bit in the last couple of last day, just to make it better. One of the main comments was why don't they go back and they, they create these sites in the universe, these holes in the ground or um, sites created, and they couldn't understand why the, the, the teams were 
um, wouldn't want to come and visit them, visit the sites as if they were their, the, the, the archaeologist's property. And a lot of the uh, people were saying, the archaeologists, they need to make them part of us. They can, you know, the local people are saying, the archaeologists need to find a way to make the sites belong to us. Uh, and there's very much a at the moment, they belong to the archaeologists, the archaeologists created them, and they belong to them. So, two questions. One is, how do you, is that our aim to be able to kind of transfer ownership? And if we're kind of committed to long term ideas of working with communities and making sure what we create is then an asset that's use, uh, useful for them, at what stage, or do we, <coughs> or what stage do we let go? At what stage do we accept that they no longer belong to us and have to do whatever other people wish to do with them, be able to let go? Is, is that, does the point ever come? Where we do that or? Uh, well, I think so, because um, the decisions that are made at, at Bound 9, for example, uh, are, well, for the Department of the Institute of Archaeology's decision, right? The IPD, I mean, uh, so what, I mean, once buildings are excavated, I guess, um, although sometimes you can work with the government even on this building getting excavated, right? Uh, so yeah, would I you mean if someone came up? Oh. And then the people who are hired to, to work at Lamanitis Guards um, are local. Um, the gift shops are local. Um, and then Marco Gonzalez, of course, that was run, was run right away by the local community, so we worked with them. Uh, so I don't know whether I've ever thought of the site of this mine, although probably right now, let's say if someone decided to permit to excavate a Marco Gonzalez, I, I, that I would, I would not like because I'm not done yet. <laughs> There's more I would like to do. But in terms of uh, the local community, I think that we, it, it varies so much. Now, West at one time, it was out in the bush for a long time, and the local community that's there is actually a refugee community from Guatemala, very late uh, into the country. But they they do uh, seem to see the site as theirs. They work there, uh, and then it's these connections, which I was a bit pessimistic about. But if we can still keep those up, you know, like I would say it is their site. Um, I don't think about my life. even now. Someone could come along and excavate it. Be okay with me. Yeah, I don't know if that's really. I was just going to say, you know, I, I realize because I, I have a you know, couple of sites that I work on too. And as archaeologists, we do develop a sense of ownership, which is good. I mean, what's it's temporary, of course. Um, but that eventually we need to let go because ultimately the site belongs to the, to, to the country, you know, because it believes their national heritage, for instance, not, um, not for anyone in particular. Uh, so that's important, but you know, I also think that one of the responsibilities should be of nation states. Nation state are, uh, agencies should have responsibilities too to the people who come to do research there and to do work there. So to make you know everything very clear. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to bring up um, a situation I'm in in Mexico, which I think again is one of those kind of pictures where both the, the nation states goal and the community goal do not align. And in fact, I'm working with a community related to a Maya rebellion of 150 years ago against the government. And in fact, this community still rebels against the government. And they, they have physically removed uh, members of the Instituto Nacional de Antropología y Historia. From the, from the community, I mean, they picked them up and walked them out of town and threatened them. Um, and so here we have the desire to preserve and work on heritage issues that are local, and the community wants to do this, um, while the state is not really wary of it, but in fact has decided that they're not going to support that type of work. Um, details of what's happened over the last few years are not important other than to say there's a disjunction between those, those two pieces. Um, and the difficulty has been I have responsibility for both. Um, and in some sense, I cannot, and I actually don't know what, what happens next. 
but I probably have to go talk to Mexico City and figure out what they're willing to let me do. Um, and then also work with the community. But one of the interesting things was this was a community project where there were five directors. And at one point, we negotiated together that we could have five directors. At the end, the day before the permit was due, they wrote an email saying, sorry, you can't have five directors. You can only be the director from outside. Um, and fortunately, they sent me the email and I was able to show to my co-directors and say, what do we do? And then we had to discuss and figure out where we're going to submit a permit and so on. But the issues are interesting when you have these discussions about goals, desires, and what people are willing to do at the multiple levels that the archaeologists have responsibility for. I don't know if there's a question. Well, I mean, Jaime would probably agree that um, there are even there are different agendas even in the, in the police government. Even in the administration of the sites, there are those who are more um, oriented towards parks, for example, right, the Brown and the Remit, and uh, others who are more oriented towards uh, research. So uh, there are there are different agendas, perhaps not always that um, that clear cut. I expect it's potentially possible in Belize, though, because uh, there are so many different ethnic groups that they you know uh, feel differently towards the sites. And uh, I guess in those circumstances, you will, like what you're doing, you just have to do the best you can under the circumstances. So there, there were moments when I was waiting for the police to come arrest me that I was doing archaeological oh. work with the community oh. and hoping that the government didn't decide it was time to throw the radio in jail. <laughs> we'll come and get you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just add, uh, you know, the, the one area where, you know, we sometimes have those issues uh, Obviously, in the developing country, um, often the, the central government wants to see more tourism because it means more revenues, more jobs created, etc. Um, but again, you know, um, as as an archaeologist who manages the, the heritage, I've learned that you know I have to work with those people. So you go in there and you say, guess what? This site can handle a large, has a larger carrying capacity, and yes, we can open that site for cruise tourism. But there's this cave site that's very fragile. And if you allow to uh, cruise tourism at that site, I'm resigning. And I will make the country know why I resign. So like I said, you know, one of our obligations as our colleagues is if you don't like it, then you know, indicate it. In my case, I'll resign if the government would ever decide to allow true mass tourism at sites that I have determined are too fragile. I could ask Tommy a question that made me think about the fact that although some of the, quite a number of the tourists who come will ask why uh, something isn't done on the site or you know where the money goes and there's some belief that all of the income from archaeology goes right to, to the department that handles archaeology but that isn't true all the income you know goes to the central government right and then they decide how to what to do with it so. Uh, I was just thinking there's a disjunction sometimes between what uh, tourists, both local and foreign, you know, think can be done uh, with archaeological sites because they think that the increase in income from archaeology actually directly goes back to archaeology, and that, that can be a problem as well. There's been a change since Liz uh, was at the uh, Archaeology in Belize. Um, all the income that we make now goes to the National Institute of Culture and History. Yes, which uh, there are four divisions of that um, Institute of Culture and History. Archaeology is the largest uh, department within that. So we keep the money. It doesn't go to central government. Yeah, but those anthropologists get a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can raise your hand. Hi. I think I'll turn this to this. Um, this is in my experience. Expect this level of session, a conversation on ethics. Ethics are the domain of professional associations who create codes of ethics. I don't know anybody else who does that. I was impressed by what you said and how you adapt your work at the truth both of you, which I would say is it exhibits both an ethical approach and a professional approach. And yet, as you pointed out, at least on your vacations, that you don't consider yourself a professional. Well, 
cultural it's heritage. It's difficult to make that question out there, except that to say, why don't you? And what is it that, that makes as far as you can think of questionable, and therefore, where do those things come from? Well, I just, oh, I, I just think that if perhaps I was trained in cultural heritage or public archaeology, then I'd be a better manager. I mean, uh, and that, that would be what I would be, what I would be doing full time. But I'm not managing resources full time. I, I still do. Uh, I mean, one of my goals now, I'm actually working on some dark earth research. Just you know, has nothing to, you know, to do with. But you know that. Professionalism or being a professional doesn't mean you do it full time. It doesn't mean you're paid to do it. It means you do it in a professional manner. Okay. <laughs> 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 so I put very unhappily the Institute of Archaeology, which is part of the conversation. We'll talk a bit just for the rest of the audience. Professionalism has nothing to do with pay, it has all to do with how you conduct what you do. And as the IFA here has hundreds of members whose primary employment has nothing to do with archaeology and heritage. They're bankers and accountants and, and plumbers and, and all the rest of them. But they are still members because they, when they do archaeology or when they do heritage management or oral history, they do it to professional standards, which is nothing to pay. It's how you do the quality of the work. Um, hi, uh, you mentioned earlier about the long term planning. And um, one thing I wanted to ask you in, at the moment in the UK, we have a bit of a problem, a uh, bit of a problem, with the storage of archaeological materials that are excavated. Now, obviously, it's different in um, a developed or a country where um, we have a lot of commercial development and therefore a lot of archaeological materials that have been derived from such projects. But in these developing countries, you're expecting in the future. That there should be probably more excavation, more archaeology, therefore producing more materials. And one of the things I wanted to ask you was um, in the kind of long term project planning and financial um, planning, do, do you take into consideration the kind of storage of those materials? And you mentioned earlier about um, actual containers and making sure that those materials be survived. But um, how is it organised in some places like Greece? Well, uh, let me, there are two parts of my response. So first of all, uh, we already had been running into problems where, you know, archaeologists 10 years ago or even more recently and before um, excavate a site and then at the end of their project, they leave all their collections in a makeshift building made out of, you know, sticks that they cut in the, in the forest and a thatch roof and then they, they depart. Well, three years later or five years later, that building is falling apart. The plastic bags or the bags that they had, all the ceramic sins are kind of done. And then we get a call from the community saying, you know, what are you going to do about it? And so, um, you know, that's one of the responsibilities that I said that our just need to understand that they have um, an obligation to ensure that those collections are not just destroyed. Um, and so we're already saying, to address that. how do we address the problem? Um, I just recently included in my budget, um, you know, two hundred thousand dollars for construction of storage facility because we've outgrown the present storage facility. Um, you know, so we can put it in our budget, but we can also apply um, for other kinds of monies uh, in, from different areas. Uh, right now, we're considering making a loan um, or trying to get money to build a, a new national museum. A large part of that money will include. A new storage facility. And so obviously, you mentioned you sort of access by having these in the local officials that these access or continued access to that too. Yes, and that's that's one of the goals that the access will be much easier. We have to forgive my ignorance. Yeah, I should say that I, one of the things that I've done at Long High is stop digging um, years ago. Uh, then I also made it incumbent upon all of the graduate students to go. PhDs that if they wanted to dig there, they had to help uh, you know, raise money for storage and accessibility. None of them has done so. They actually went on to, to other sites. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm smiling. But, uh, but we, we've been in few, we've been talking about this with all of the people in, in, in 
beliefs. And uh, one of the things that we're doing also is developing ways of putting material back in the ground, uh, shirts, in, in ways that if archaeologists are interested in excavating them, they can find them. Um, so that's one thing that, that, that material, I think, should be reburied. Now, not all of my colleagues believe that, but it's going to happen. The other thing is, when you say a museum, I recognize this as well. One of the things that we're interested in doing is trying to think of other ways besides just museums, artifact libraries, uh, certain kinds of artifacts that people that are stored in places where, where people can handle them. We actually did have that for a while on nine smaller buildings where artifacts were out on shelves. And some of them did great. And see, this is something else. We don't really have to deal with um, conservatives who would like some conservatives. Well, like, who would like to see everything behind uh, steel, in, you know, steel, I don't know, safes. Uh, but there are some things that can be broken and they can be put back, or they were broken. And, and I think it's, it's better to have kids who might handle an artifact and it, maybe it becomes damaged and you have to fix it, then keeping it out of sight. But that it is that is a problem that not everyone agrees you know, with with me. And I think probably you're more or less with me on that. But that takes it takes a lot of thinking that we haven't really done much of. You know, and also even thinking of, of, of hierarchical ways that people by hierarchy I mean let's say there's a museum, then there might be an artifact library. An artist's library is another idea that we had and started where you have a lot of copies of artifacts, uh, where all of the designs on vessels, like this little one, have been uh, drawn and then available. So there's lots of ways you can have access. Uh, but in terms of research money, I can't get money for that from the research organization. Can I ask a follow up question? Because you raised the question of the ethics of the um, Two questions. One is, what about just chucking some of it away anyway? And the other, the provocative one, is why not sell some of the artifacts? And then we'll move on. Let me, let me do a quick response to the second uh, uh, part of your question. Um, the, the problem with you know selling some of them, because this is not the first time you know, this has been proposed to me as a manager of cultural heritage. And the, the problem is that, you know, where do you draw the line? And if you start to do that, you know, then you create a situation where people believe, oh, well, everything is for sale. And when you work in a developing country, they think already that archaeologists steal all these artifacts and take them back anyway. So you don't want to perpetuate that, you know, that idea. And so that's the challenge with, with, with that issue. But you know, to, to go on with that same question and the one done by, by the young woman up there before, um, is that you know, managing cultural heritage is a daunting task, especially in the developing world. It's not easy. And I was trained as an archaeologist, that was a cultural heritage manager. I learned everything I did on my feet, you know, by trial and error. Um, I'm still learning. Um, we had, you know, we've had several cases where we have loaned objects you know, from archaeologists who go to work in Belize, and they're at the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada, or they're at, you know, different universities like across, you know, the, the world. And uh, just recently, uh, this one colleague was uh, retiring or leaving from that job to another job, and he says, I have all these materials that, you know, I brought out of Belize legally, you know, under permit to, to export for study. Um, what do I do with it? You know, I need to send them back. And I was like, oh my God. I said, please, can you keep them for a longer? Because I don't have the storage. And I felt that it was my ethical obligation to not to bring them and put them in, in, in areas where they'd be poorly preserved. So we negotiated that one of the ex-students who now works at a museum, that we would transfer the loan to them until such time when we can really bring them back responsibly. So uh, these are all ethical issues and obligations. The sad thing is not entirely out of order, though, because <clears throat> we're actually thinking, we haven't discussed this yet, but uh, Marco Gonzalez, the site out on the key, I don't know if you can see this. I brought a little calendar that the community uh, put together to sell to raise money, but we have thousands of conch shells. Thousands and thousands and thousands of conch shells. 
with uh, their artifacts because the Maya have made these old walls now and then. We've actually thought about selling those. We haven't done it, but it's something that we might propose because it, it, it could uh, take care of some aspects of clearing the site as well as. Um, I mean, it's possible. We haven't done it. Okay. <laughs> Is someone here? Did you still have a question? <laughs> uh, this just sort of follows up on the uh, can of worms that we just sort of opened up here. Um, regarding the selling of uh, antiquities, uh, it, it actually, uh, as I'm sure you're probably aware of, uh, has been done in both Japan and, and Israel with, with actually a great deal of success. But part of that is because it is highly regulated. Um, so uh, th there, there is that line that can be drawn, so so to speak. But again, you have to be very careful about it, and, and you do have to, you know, regulate it um, very severely, as it were, so that there is this understanding of what is regarded as, you know, heritage, um, not just like something that's grandiose, but something that um, is is a value. Whether that's the Japanese government or you know the Japanese people, and then what, what's what's something that uh, um, you know is acceptable for them to sell on the world market. Um, so you can say anything for Israel. Um, another option uh, that you may want to consider, I, I don't know if you have. Um, this is more so on a museum level, though. But that's also a problem with storage, or, or maybe if you are, if you are using museums for storage, um, it's something that has actually been done here. In the UK, uh, pretty recently, and that is actually going through the collections and finding what isn't really relevant um, to that particular museum or to that particular theme, maybe even storeroom, and selling those not abroad on the you know world market, but to the museums um, who might find the value for their particular collections, and then using the money that you receive to um, you know. Do whatever, whether that's expanding your storage facilities or expanding your conservation facilities. Um, this is all. This also actually has sort of sparked a bit of an ethical debate over you know, whether or not it should be selling. But um, I have a think it's actually a very good idea to just sort of clean out what is necessary um, and you know bring in the funds that are going to help you do what is necessary. But uh, there's another little can of worms for you. All right, just a great point that. The, there are professional ones that have been as successful as the current ones. Um, the Israel one has been studied and was more personal. It's been all university and questions on how viable that is. So I, I just want to question the success of those programs. <laughs> I was just curious also, the artifacts are so because I don't know if they are. Um, <clears throat> if they, are they from an archaeological context so that then the person who buys the the artifact is responsible for uh, keeping the records uh, on that particular artifact. Because I would, I mean, no, they're all loose. They're all loose. The uh, Standby and Antiquities Authority is very in and very from the state of Israel, but the artifacts themselves are looted. Never came to an archaeological excavation unless they've been stolen. I was going to say that some of your suggestions sounded like stress on um, In this case, the stress being, uh, you know, not enough storage uh, space. We've come up with some ideas of trying to address that. Uh, for instance, in the days that you find artifacts, we'll give you a permit to keep them in your possession in your home, um, but you can't export it yourself. So um, in other cases, for instance, uh, human remains uh, do poorly in the tropics, uh, and, it's been, and even in storage, unless we have air conditioned situations. Um, one thing that we've done is we've allowed the exportation to, uh, to universities for study. Um, and of course, in those institutions, they have air conditioned rooms, etc. Till some point in time when we can then repatriate them. Uh, so the you know you just have to get creative in how you manage this heritage and when you don't have the funds. Following uh, up on this issue, I did propose last year to solve the high court in Philadelphia, and I noticed. I come originally from Egypt and I have millions of ceramic, for example, silver and stone rooms. And when we bought these stone rooms, we found that there's dust because the stone rooms are not really meant to hold them for such a long time. So I made a practical proposal. Why doesn't some of these extractors pay for 
restoration, conservation, all these farmers take them on long loans to most of the concerns are going to do that. Take them on long, about 20, 30 years, and then train them uh, periodically with more objects from various countries, including Egypt, Yemen, Sudan, etc., etc. This way, they pay for the conservation of the, the, the materials, and they show them the local things, and both countries gain. So, a kind of international, long, long term, long agreement. And also, this way, this is the impact of the antique dealers and the antique market because these museums don't have to go and spend millions of dollars on buying antiquities to show the museums because you can get them for much less than the antique market. And then on loan, so they go back to these countries at 30 years, 20 years in return. We already are doing that. In fact, as I speak, we just negotiated a loan agreement with uh, five different um, museums in the U.S. where we are allowing them, uh, where we're going to uh, export the materials for them to exhibit, and the exhibition will take uh, three years. And other museums are already starting to say yes, we're interested. And uh, part of the agreement is that some of the objects they will have to conserve. So yes. <laughs> we, uh, I think we're getting close to the end time on this one. Sorry about it. <laughs> <laughs>